Good to see everybody out this morning. Got a good crowd, 75. Travis and I both confirmed that with two, two accounting processes. So good to have everybody here. Let's give ourselves a round of applause. I said Travis, I meant Eli. So you can tell what kind of day this is going to be starting off, okay? I guess before we, before we turn loose of the kids for Children's Church with Tony and Sherry have, I'd like, since we're going to be celebrating our nation's uh, 242nd birth, birthday, I think it would be appropriate to stand and, and just offer a pledge of allegiance to our flag. So if you would, please stand. I want to do that as a congregation. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, Children's Church, 12 and under. Tony and Sherry have that. Uh, 12 and under for Children's Church. Good looking crew getting up. We're going to have a good crowd for that today. And if you'd like to go ahead and mark in your hymnals, uh, 323 is thy heart right with God will be the hymn of invitation this morning. It's certainly good to have everybody out. Good to see everybody. Again, if you're visiting, we want to welcome you and invite you to be back with us at any time. If you're following us on YouTube and are in the area, we'd like to have you here with us if possible. And if you're looking for a church home, we would like for you to consider Locust Grove. That's that. It's always an honor and a privilege for me to share in God's Word with you. And certainly today is no different. And if you have neighbors like mine, the 4th of July celebration started Friday night and will continue through Sunday evening next week. And uh, we've heard the fireworks going off already. And many of the municipalities and, uh, have already, I think London had theirs, and, and I'm not sure if they had theirs down at the lake this weekend, so it's done. But they'll probably have them next weekend too, and that's, that's good. Uh, good to have those celebrations. Uh, 242 years. If you think about that, other than the African nations where they split all of those up and renamed them a few years ago, uh, as far as large world powers, the United States is the youngest nation, youngest country uh, on the planet uh, at 242. And, and we still go through some growing pains and can expect that on into the future. Uh, as well, but certainly continue to keep our nation uh, in your prayers, as Dennis mentioned in his prayers. I think we have on the prayer list Supreme Court Justice is going to be nominated, and let's let's pray that the right person is is confirmed for that position. And of course, uh, the events going around on around the world. Let's be in prayer for other world leaders as well. Have you ever put much thought into what it would have been like to have been around at the time of the Revolutionary War? Just to consider not necessarily the time changes, but the differences in the way things, you know, we were, we were a territory basically uh, of England, uh, Great Britain, uh, if you would. And at that time, I guess they could say the sun never, the sun never set on the, on the Union Jack, which means that they had they had territories all around the globe, so at one point in time, the sun would always be rising or setting uh, on a country where they occupied, and we were no different at that particular time. But it was not desirable. Uh, we wanted to be free, just like, not unlike the pilgrims. When they came, uh, looking for a place to live, a place to call home, a place where they could worship God, uh, in their own way, our forefathers wanted to separate ourselves from England, obviously, uh, that we might have a home, a place to call our own. And that's what I want us to think about as we continue our series this week, Finding Hope in a Hopeless World. We'll look at a point this morning about finding our hope. And if last week, if you recall, we talked about where is your heart, we asked that question. If it was in the world or if you had sanctified or set apart Jesus in your heart as Savior. Well, this morning we're going to ask the question, where is your home? And you may be thinking, well, Rob, uh, my home is down the road or uh, across town or whatever. And that's not what I'm talking about. And I think you'll understand a little more when we get into this. 
We're going to continue to look at 1 Peter. Uh, if you want to go ahead and turn in your Bibles, uh, we're going to continue our study there, this letter that Peter wrote. And we're going to study and see and answer, and hopefully answer the question about where is our home. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4 is where we're going to begin this morning. And Peter writes and says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Now Peter is encouraging the folks here that he's writing this letter to, and us, really, that we have a future. I like that line that he put in there, or that word he put in there, it's reserved in heaven. Many of us go on vacations, rarely will we just pick up and leave and go to Florida, South Carolina, Alabama, wherever beach you like to go to without making a reservation first to know that you have some place to stay before you get there, right? And that's how we can look at this. As Christians, we have reservations in heaven. And that's what Peter is encouraging us to remember. That's what we need to always remember ourselves when we look at this and think about the promises that God has made. Now, also, we need to keep in mind that the people that Peter is actually writing this letter to at this time are dispersed. They're dispersed in a large area because of persecution. Some of that from, from Nero and others from uh, other persecution from the Jews that are opposing the spreading of Christianity. But he wants to continue to remind them that they have that future. Paul wrote in Philippians 3.20, he says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly await for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. For Christian... This place that we call home, this place that we know as our home, is not our home at all. Just temporary lodging, just like when we go on vacation. We rent a condo or a motel or, or a beach house or whatever. We know that that's temporary lodging. Sometimes we go and think, boy, I'd sure like to be able to live here the whole time. But we're, we know that at the appointed time, when the week's up or two weeks, however long you stay, you have to vacate that. But that's the wonderful thing about heaven. Once we're there, once our reservation is confirmed through the blood of Christ, once we occupy that suite, we'll say, in heaven, we don't have to leave. We're there permanently. And that's what we have to understand. This is temporary, and though it's hard for us to wrap our minds around, this is all that we know. From the time that we're born and, and we have the mental capacity to realize that we are in this world, all we know is this world, and the rest is something unseen, and it's hard for us to imagine or place much hope in that, but that's exactly what Peter is telling us to do, to place hope in the fact that we have reservations in heaven. We're waiting on Jesus Christ to return to take us back to that place. My Father's house has many mansions. I go there to prepare a place for you, he says. So you can just kind of imagine, since we're kind of talking about vacation analogies, uh, it's like a, a giant condominium. And Jesus is adding room for us. And we don't have to leave once we get there. And that's what Peter's telling him. So we're going to look this morning at three points to help us answer this question. And we're going to begin looking at this and just asking again, just where is your home? 1 Peter 1, 17 says this, And if you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. Now there's two points I want to make note of here. You notice he says if we're going to be judged according to our own work, we should be doing, remember we talked about that last week, to pursue that which was good, if we, which would we rather get in trouble for, doing good or doing evil. But notice something he says here. The time of your stay here. That's temporary language, isn't it? 
the time of your stay. That's just, again, like that motel reservation. We hope you enjoy your stay with us. Because they know it's temporary. And, and that's what he's writing about here. He's speaking in temporary terms, and that's how we have to think. We're here for a short stay. And I'm learning as I go older the wisdom of the, the, the folks that told me enjoy life now because when you get older it's going to fly by. I really understand what that means now. Because it, half the year's gone today. We start the back half of 2018. And it just seemed like yesterday we were celebrating uh, a New Year's. And I understand. It goes by quick. It's like a vapor. It's told to us in the scripture. And we understand that. So that shows even more the temporary state of this place that we live. Because time does go by so quickly. In John, four, uh, John chapter 1 verse 14 just to show that this not only affects us, but John writes and says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us and beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus set this example for us first. We don't think about that. His coming here was for a short, temporary, specified amount of time. According to God's plan. He came to give us an example how to live here. Knowing that his home was not here and our home as followers of him would not be here. When he knew this, the people around him, he, even though he taught his disciples that, and the people that followed him didn't understand that because if you remember when he came into Jerusalem, they wanted to set him up as a king like David, which was more of a permanent arrangement. They didn't understand that he was supposed to be here some 33 odd years. But Jesus understood it. That this was a temporary place. He had a specific reason for being here. A specific job to do while he was here. And that's what, remember he was always busy about his father's work. Not my will, but the will of him who sent me. There was a reason he had urgency. There was a reason he stayed focused on what he did. Because he knew his time here was limited. And he taught us how to live in this world with that same type of concept. That our time here is limited. And we have to remember that. But they didn't get it when he was around and, and it's easy for us not to as well. We should feel a little out of place here. It's a little odd when you go to the motel or, or wherever you stay on vacation. You don't sleep so good that first night, do you? You might take your own pillow, but you certainly can't take your own mattress on vacation with you, can you? So you never sleep hardly as good that first night, but by the end of the week you're sleeping pretty good because you've kind of gotten used to your surroundings. And that's the way that we as Christians should feel. We should feel a little out of place here because of the fact that we are separated from the actions of the people that live in the world. We should feel a little uncomfortable at times. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. It says in Hebrews 13 verse 14 that for here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. This is not our hope. We're seeking that hope of a heavenly city is what the writer of Hebrews is talking about. And during the course of that seeking, as he says, we should be living the example of Jesus, showing compassion, showing love and forgiveness to the people that we encounter because that's exactly what he did. But like last week, we get a little uncomfortable, don't we? When we have to expose ourselves to that sharing and serving Jesus. It goes back to that heart issue that we talked about, that commitment issue. We experience, and we know this, we experience pain and hurt while we're here. Because not everyone that we come into contact with shares our point of view and our views about God and who Jesus Christ is. About the importance of serving the Lord with our lives and everything that we do. We, we know that. We have that with family members that don't share that. Co-workers and friends that don't share that. And we are a little uncomfortable and share maybe sometimes because of those relationships. Maybe we don't see them very often. Maybe we avoid them or they avoid us or a combination of the two, and there's a little hurt when we come in contact with that. I get it. I understand that. 
I understand that we're going to have pain because Jesus had pain, didn't he? Jesus had pain and suffered while he was here. We should be no different. But the encouragement that we have to remember and understand is, uh, was written in Revelations 21 verse 4. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, no sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no pain. The former things have passed away. Those things that, that drag us down, those things that are associated with this world in heaven will be no more. And that's what we have to remember and keep that hope and that encouragement is the temporary suffering that we, we suffer here during this temporary stay, the time of our stay, that will be wiped away in the future. Never again to cry, pain, sorrow. In heaven there will be no one there that does not share your belief of who God is. No one there that will not share your belief of who Jesus Christ is. That we will all have in common. And that is a great thing, a great thought to think about. All the bad stuff here is only temporary. The joy is permanent. So that's a good thought. And here's another simple fact that we may not realize. If you are a Christian, this world is as close to hell as you will ever come. If you are not a Christian, this world is as close to heaven as you will ever come. And we don't think about that at times. But this is a temporary stay for everyone, regardless whether you believe and have accepted Christ as your Savior. For the Christian, we live here, but this is not our home. So how can we have hope? How can we have that hope? How can we live that? 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, he goes on and reminds us first, and we should be reminded, these folks are scattered now all over the place. And secondly, like us, before Christ, they were not a royal priesthood. They were not a heavenly people. They were not people that had any kind of hope. Just like me, before I became, in, became a Christian, before I came into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, I had no hope. I had no future. And that's what Peter's reminding them and us here. But with Christ, we have a future. And that's what we have to remember. God is not concerned about our past. Satan would have you to think he is. Satan would weigh you down with your mistakes of the past so that your future looks clouded and dim. But that's not what the Bible tells us. That we have a future because of Jesus Christ in spite of ourselves. If it was left up to any of us in this room to go to heaven on our own, we would be hopelessly lost, all of us. But because of Jesus Christ, we all have the hope of a future of eternity in heaven in spite of ourselves. And that's what we have to remember. So how is it that we can have this hope? Well, Peter gives us kind of a how-to list. How to live in this world with hope. How to live in this world but not be part of this world. And the next verse is uh, after 9 and 10. So let's look at this. Uh, 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. He says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in times past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Now do you see what I was saying? Does that match up? Does that tie up? We, just like them, we were not a people. We had no mercy. We had no hope before, but after Christ, we do. So now that we have this promise and we have this assurance, how is it that we live successfully here? Well, this is the how-to list, starting in verse 11. First, he says, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, again, temporary stuff, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. So what does that mean, Rob? We have to guard our minds. We have to guard our hearts. We have to be careful about what comes in because it affects us so much that it will affect what comes out. Remember what Christ said? It's not what goes in the, uh, the mouth of a man that defiles him, but what proceeds. Talking about when they wouldn't wash their hands. 
And that's what we have to realize. We have to guard ourselves about what comes in, what we allow to come in, what we purposely sometimes put in, because it will eventually affect what comes out. And that's what Peter's saying here. Don't get caught up in the world. Don't get caught up in what they're doing. Verse 12, he says, Have your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may... But your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. How do you react when a server brings you the wrong food or messes up your order? What about when somebody cuts you off in traffic? Or somebody in one of, this happened to me the other day, one of those little old ladies in the grocery store runs over your toe with a, a jazzy loaded with groceries because she wanted to beat you to the Y part there. How do you react in those instances? That's what defines us, and that's what he's talking about here. Let our conduct be as ambassadors. I've I've used that once before in a sermon. We are ambassadors of heaven. We understand what an ambassador is, a representative of a country. Well, we seek our own country in heaven, not a temporary one here. So how is your conduct here? Do people say this? Well, they aren't much of a Christian according to the way they acted the other day. If they're a Christian, I've got it made. And that's what we have to realize. We have to realize that our conduct has to be as Peter described here. Honorable among the Gentiles. In other words, honorable among those that do not believe. That when they, notice he didn't say if. That when they speak against you as evildoers, they may. But your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. So when they talk about you, they can. But what in the reality is, your conduct overrides what they say because you're acting in an honorable way. Verse 13, therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to king as supreme or governor's. As to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. Yes, like it or not, voted for them or not, we have to honor the elected officials. Those placed in power over us. We're to obey the law of the land. That we may, and that may not set too well with us sometimes. But what's what we're called to do? Jesus even said that. Remember when they asked about... uh, Paying taxes, was it lawful for them to pay taxes? And he asked them whose face was that inscribed, or what was the inscription upon the coin? Me paraphrasing, and they said Caesar. And we recall what Jesus said, Give unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, but unto God that which is God's. And that's what we have to realize and understand, because we are temporary citizens here. We must obey the law. Just like if you go on a vacation in a foreign country. And they have a law that differs from what we have in the United States. That doesn't mean that you can't, don't have to obey that law, does it? Well, in the U.S., the speed limit is 70. Well, you're not in the U.S. anymore, Toto. And that's what we have to understand. Because of that, we are, we are not permanent citizens of this world. Our hope is in heaven, but we still have to obey the rulers above us. Except, Acts 5, 29, except when they, the rule is contrary to the word of God. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. And that was Peter's response to the command to not preach in the name of Jesus Christ. We do not, as Christians, we are not obligated to follow the law of the land when it takes us into violation of God's law. Our loyalty first is to God and his law. Now that may someday run into consequences. We have found that in the past couple of years beginning to push the envelope with the trials about uh, the bakers and and providing services for uh, folks that uh, have views other than Christian views. Marriage license, I mean we know what we're talking about here. That has pushed the envelope. But have you noticed that I can't think of a case that did not come out on the side of right 
so far that's been to court in those. It was a little temporary pain, a little temporary discomfort for those folks, but thus far, those that stood on the side of God have come out on, on the side of right. Those freedoms have been protected. Peter's response there. Verses 15 and 16. For this is the will of God that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. We're called to live free lives. We are called to live free lives, free to do, free to pursue that which is good. Remember last week talking about pursuing that which is good? Not using the forgiveness of and mercy and grace of God that we can sin so that grace may abound. Remember that part? Heaven forbid. But to live as free, to live as Christians, going about pursuing and doing that which is good. And then he summarizes it up in verse 17. He says, Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. Now, some of your Bibles may say emperor. Honor the emperor. You know who that emperor was at the time of writing this? It was Nero. And you know what Nero was doing to Christians at the time of this? He was killing them. He was, uh, he was not supportive of Christianity. But yet what does Peter say to do for the emperor or the king? Honor. Even though they were being persecuted... That's how important it is for us to live that kind of life. Even in the face of persecution, and yes, at that point in time, even in the face of death, they are still to conduct themselves, we are still to conduct ourselves in an honorable fashion so that God can be glorified through our actions. Now that's a tough, tough one to kind of swallow too, isn't it? And again, I remind you, think about who's telling us this. Peter, who ran, denied, but now he's encouraging to stand and act honorably, even to the point that he did that now, from what history tells us. We're called to live strong Christian lives. We are equipped to live strong Christian lives also. <clears throat> Which leads us to our last point real quickly. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also, also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. That's why we were called to it. Because Jesus came to give us the example, and when we accept him, we are expected to follow that example. That's why we do it. We're not to render evil for evil. We're not called to overlook suffering. We're not called to be unforgiving. Now Jesus, we know, had plenty of chances to do all of those things, but yet he acted in the opposite way, didn't he? Compassion, love, and forgiveness. That's what we're called to as Christians. That's the why. We're not home yet. We must not be discouraged with temporary lodgings. There's one other simple question I want you to consider today. And I don't mean just today. I mean consider this throughout the course of the week. Do you believe that your conduct here on earth will be acceptable in heaven? If you are a Christian, the way you conduct yourself daily, are you going to have to change? When Christ calls us back? Yeah, think about that one. Think about that throughout the course of the week. And if you said no, well, just when do you plan on start living like a Christian? When you got to heaven? Well, that was the old me. <laughs> this is the new me. Well, God wants the new me now while we're here. There should be no distinction between us here and how we conduct ourselves in heaven. Because we have that promise 
that reservation, remember? We don't live and look for here. We look for something beyond. And if we're going to live there, Harold kind of mentions this in his prayers or when he talks sometimes uh, about if we can't get along down here, how are we going to get along in heaven? We ain't. That's not going to be that way. We're not going to fuss and fight and bicker and then go up there and change. I'm not saying that we won't be changed because the Bible tells us that. But we must, using that same thought in mind, and that's what he means, I believe, by that, is that we have to get along, we have to strive to live the way that we want to live in heaven while we're here. Shouldn't we be living our lives like we're citizens of heaven? Now, you can't do that unless you are a Christian. Because you have to have the Holy Spirit in order to be successful in that. And to have the Holy Spirit, you first have first had to hear the word and believe it. And then you have to confess Jesus Christ as your Savior and then repent of your sins and be buried with him in baptism when that's when you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and the remission of sins, raise that new creation to serve faithfully until Christ returns or until we're called away in death. Now, if you've never done that, you have that opportunity here in just a minute. But what, here's the other scenario. What if you're a Christian sitting here and you answer to yourself, no, my conduct really isn't going to be acceptable in heaven. Well, I want to encourage you to change that today. You can do that right now, this very minute. Not nothing to do with me or anyone here. That's strictly between you and the Lord. But for heaven's sake, change it. Get back on the right track. Ask God to guide you. Use the Holy Spirit and allow yourself to be led by the Holy Spirit. And begin to conduct yourself in an honorable fashion as Peter calls us to do. So that his, God's name would be glorified. Whatever the situation that we find ourselves in. And we're going to sing a hymn of invitation 323, Is Thy Heart Right With God? And that's so far what we've been looking at last week about where our heart is. This week where our home is. Is our hearts right with God? That's the only way that we're going to find hope in a hopeless world. Is if we're in tune with what God has in store for us. We're going to sing, I believe it's the first and the fourth verse of this hymn. If you have a decision to make, would you come as we stand and sing?